Um, hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. I am delighted at this turnout, and I am really excited that you can be here with us this evening and that we can all be here together for the first of our next series of um, the Beyond the Wall speaker series. That is a really great partnership between the Oshawa Public Libraries and Ontario Tech University, in which we take time out of our busy schedules to get together and talk about ongoing issues and, and research and, and to share what we're doing with each other. I'd like to begin this evening with a land acknowledgement. And I want to say that we are thankful to be welcome on these lands in friendship. The lands we are situated on are covered by the Williams Treaties and are the traditional territory of the Mississaugas, a branch of the greater Anishinaabeg Nation, including Algonquin, Ojibwe, Odawa, and Potawatomi. These lands remain home to many Indigenous nations and peoples. We acknowledge this land out of respect for the Indigenous nations who have cared for Turtle Island, also called North America, from before the arrival of settler peoples until this day. More importantly, we acknowledge that the history of these lands has been tainted by poor treatment and a lack of friendship with the First Nations who call them home. This history is something we are all affected by because we are all treaty people in Canada. We all have a shared history to reflect on and each of us is affected by this history in different ways. Our past defines our present, but if we move forward as friends and allies, then it does not have to define our future. For the rest of our program this evening, we're going to be beginning by turning over the first 20 minutes to our panelists who have joined us, and then we'll be using the rest of the time for some Q&A after. So if I could please get you to keep yourselves on mute, and then as soon as we get to the Q&A portion, we can start unmuting folks so we can hear your questions. Uh, for members of the media, please identify yourselves by chat to Jennifer Gardner, and she can hook you up with any additional information you may need. I would like to start by briefly introducing our panelists, beginning with Dr. Vivian Stematopoulos, who is an associate teaching professor at Ontario Tech University, and her research specializes in family caregiving. She's joined by Kathy Parks, an activist working for change in long-term care. She's also joined by Melissa Miller, a trial advocate specializing in elder law, and Jennifer French, the MPP representing Oshawa. So, Vivian, I would be delighted to hand this over to you. All right, thank you, Andrea. Uh, well, thanks everyone for coming tonight. I'm really happy to see everyone. Um, where to start? Well, I mean, for months now, advocates and experts have been warning that the Ford government needed to use the summer months to properly safeguard the sector, lest we find ourselves in the situation we are right now, where we're starting to see a deja vu of what happened in the spring. and. Um, you know, two months into the pandemic, and we've seen that from what was a handful of uh, long-term care homes in outbreak has now rather exponentially grown to over 100 homes in outbreak with 719 residents and 521 staff currently infected. And worse yet, what we're seeing is that the same, many of the same for-profit uh, providers are just continuing to fail the COVID-19 test. They cannot seem to manage the virus once it enters the home. There was a very recent Toronto Star piece that showed that uh, residents in for-profit uh, long-term care homes are currently three times uh, more likely to contract COVID-19 and they're nearly 10 times as likely to die as a result compared to those in nonprofit homes. And despite the reality of, you know, many of the same bad actors continuing to fail this COVID-19 test, so to speak, um, they failed in the spring and they're failing now again in the fall. And um, <laughs> there are no measures to currently hold these homes accountable, which is why we really wanted to have this panel tonight. In fact, the opposite happened today with the lightning speed passing of Bill 218, as many of you know, the uh, quote unquote supporting Ontario's Recovery Act, which is anything but that. Um, instead, it actually, uh, you know, instead of supporting, let's say, the long-term care families from the horrid abuse and neglect that we saw unfold in the first wave, and that's continuing to unfold now, our government has made the very clear and unequivocal decision to protect those individuals who failed them. 
Um, and make no mistake, this exactly was a very strong and clear message sent to residents and long-term care families that it is uh, not their interests that are being protected here, but it is the shareholders. And I remind everyone that it's not just long-term care homes that are facing litigation. Yes, there are many class action lawsuits and individual lawsuits being levied against a variety of homes, but the government is actually also being sued for their uh, response to seniors in long-term care. I don't know if a lot of people know this, but uh, there's one Toronto law firm that um, filed a suit back in June uh, that the Ford government breached its duty of care essentially to nursing home residents and, and you know failed to prevent the level of destruction we saw and obviously a lot of you that know me know that I uh, clearly agree with that opinion and then the Justice Center also has filed a charter challenge against what is tantamount to mass detention orders um, and you all know that that is what got me into this advocacy that I was a very harsh um, critic of the very draconian and, and unnecessarily punitive um, visitation restrictions that we saw for, for effectively the first six months of that pandemic. Um, and the irony is not lost on me today that the day we come together for this panel is the day that we see our government create a law effectively that will prevent justice for our long-term care families and residents. And a lot of family are very understandably upset right now. Um, and I think, you know, at this point, it's a, it's a really good opportunity to pass the mic, so to speak, to uh, Kathy Parks, who went through this, who has this lived experience with losing a loved one at Orchard Villa. And I think it's really important to get families' perspectives before we pass it on to our, our other speakers. So without further ado, Kathy, my dear. Thank you, Dr. Vivian. I appreciate it. Yeah, I'm, uh, my father was in Orchard Villa long-term care in Pickering. Um, he died April 15th. Uh, prior to the pandemic and the lockdown, uh, very cognitive, very happy, um, thriving. Uh, he had a really hard time. I actually noticed a, a, a deep decline though in his physical abilities from the point that he moved into long-term care. And we really struggled. He was only in there for five months from November until April. And we really struggled with a lot of different issues. Um, and I need to even back it up and, and go back to saying, you know, I was one of those people living in Canada. You always hear the stories about long-term care and it's frightening and you think, oh, that's awful, but it didn't really affect my life. And so I didn't pay enough attention to it. My grandparents, three out of the four of them were in long-term care. There were incidents with them. Again, it was taken care of by the older generation and I wasn't really dealing with it hands-on until my own father ended up having to go in. And I really wish that there was some sort of manual that people had to tell you the steps that you have to take just to get into long-term care, the hoops that they make you jump through. Um, I dealt with, you know, uh, PSWs, Lynn set up PSWs into the home to help with my father's care. And that was even a disaster, really helpful at first. And then what happens when they don't show up, which happened a lot. And then dad can't get out of bed and he can't get dressed and he can't, and there's, it's just a never ending stream of stress and uh, confusion, getting him into long-term care. The homes I chose, which by the way, were not-for-profit homes, had eight to 10 year waiting lists. So his short list was Altamont Care, and Orchard Villa. And I think those both of those names should be pretty familiar. Um, chose Orchard Villa because I lived down the street and I thought no matter what happens to dad, I can be there. I was very involved in his life. We were very close. And uh, that was the case. There were things that happened. I was there. He was in the hospital three to four times once with renal kidney failure because he hadn't been checked on. Um, he had a UTI that had been left for so long and without antibiotics and without hydration, he ended up in the hospital in, in a um, pretty serious condition. So that was ongoing. And the thought that I had that I could always be there, COVID came along and lockdowns came along. And I was still talking to my father every day, multiple times a day. I was thankful he had his own phone. A lot of people didn't. Um, but I mean, I saw incidents of my dad called me once because his roommate was choking. And he said, listen, we've pressed this call button. Nobody's coming and he's choking. And I actually had to call the nursing station and say, you guys need to get to this room now. I can hear him choking on the phone. So um, those kinds of things. And, and there's just, there was never enough staff. The staff was overrun. The staff was exhausted. Um, but when you get into what happened with my dad, it was almost like walking around in the dark, a lot of it. There was a lot, a lack of communication. Um, 
we weren't being told or the information that I was being told as my dad was in lockdown and as he had COVID was absolutely false. I was told he was fine. I was told he was eating. Meanwhile, he was comatose and dying. I begged to be let in. I begged to let him send him to the hospital. And I was told no at every single turn. And in the end, my father ended up dying alone, which was something that he dreaded um, and something that still breaks my heart today because I wish I could have been with him. I would have done anything. I would have worn any PPE I could have to have been with him. So, and then what ended up happening after that is I realized the week after my father's death during that time, there were so many other families that I'm seeing online that I was talking to who were going through the exact same thing I was, but a week behind me. And I thought, if I don't say something, how many more people are going to end up like my dad? So I work in the media. I reached out. I said something. And that actually, which I thought was going to be a one-time thing <laughs> of me saying something on April 22nd actually ended up being months of advocating for change in long-term care, speaking out for the families. I've ended up speaking to people on, on levels that I never thought I would. You know, I'm, I'm just, I'm a person who works in media. I live a pretty average everyday life. And I saw something though that really, really disturbed me. And it's funny that when I think of all my younger years, when I knew, but I didn't really know, and now that I know, I can't not speak. So that's, that's where I am today. And through that, I met, uh, you know, Dr. Vivian and I met uh, Melissa, who's my lawyer and several of you that are here watching today, really thankful because we've been really, really supportive of each other. And without that, I'm not sure it would be a much different scenario that I'm in. But thank you for having me here today. Oh, Kathy, thank you. And I hear that all the time, right? Families, a lot of families just, you know, tell me that they, they came online or they, you know, went on Facebook or they went on Twitter because it, it gave them a community, which it really makes me happy to hear that. Um, I think that is a good segue to bring in Melissa, um, who is indeed Kathy's lawyer, and she has been really fighting hard to represent a lot of long-term care families because she has seen this um, neglect and abuse go on for far too long. So, Melissa Miller, please, there you are. Thank you. Oh, let me just, so, oh, there we go. Um, thank you, Vivian. Uh, thanks for having me here. I, I feel a little bit um, similarly to Kathy in that I, I never thought that I was going to be involved in this type of advocacy, quite frankly. I, you know, was, I'm a trial lawyer. Uh, I litigate cases and many of the people who are here are my clients. Uh, who've suffered at the hands of for-profit companies making mistakes over and over and over again. Um, but I think what we've seen through COVID is that there is a need for a coming together and a level of advocacy at every level. Um, and I feel a sense of obligation, not just to my clients, but to the general public to share my voice and bring other voices together. And that's because, you know, Kathy mentioned two things that I think are important. The first one she mentioned is that, you know, this didn't really affect her until it affected her. Um, and I think that's true for just about everyone who is involved in long-term care. Um, I have a grandmother in long-term care, but I, I have to say, um, it wasn't until I started getting phone call after phone call after phone call after phone call about the same damn things. And I just couldn't believe what I was hearing. I couldn't believe that I was hearing that people were starving to death, not being given water and dying of dehydration, dying of sepsis from a pressure injury or bed sore that became so infected that it led to osteomyelitis, which is a type of bone infection. Um, I was just speaking to another woman today and I'm, this is all pre COVID. I've been, you know, handling these cases for years. And when COVID hit and, you know, we heard that bell ring around the world about who was getting impacted by this illness. I just, the, the terror just struck in me. And I knew what this was going to mean for Canada. I knew what this was going to mean for Ontario. And I was unfortunately proven right. And, you know, we've talked a little, you know, Vivian talked about Bill 218, which I'll get to in a moment. Um, but I think what the real focus has to be here is 
these issues long preceded the inception of this disease. And the only reason why COVID ravaged our long-term care and retirement homes as much as it did is because these issues uh, existed in the first place. And it's, it's little things that snowball. Not, you know, staff not having consistency snowballs into someone not keeping track of water intake, which snowballs into someone dying of dehydration. These are very simple things. There's a lack of consistency in training. There's a lack of consistency in accountability. There's no transparency as to where our tax dollars are going. And there's no transparency in terms of what these companies are doing um, with the, with the money that they're getting and how they get to allocate the funds. One of the things that I've heard from clients is um, a, a home will, sometimes a home will try to identify additional care needs for a resident because that invites more dollars from the government, but then you don't see a necessary corresponding allocation of those resources with the care plan or how that care plan is executed. And there is a lack of balancing within the system. And that has just had reverberating consequences throughout. And then Bill 218 comes down the pipe. And I think I want to I want to talk about two things with Bill 218. The first thing I want to talk about is how devastating this is for the families who are seeking justice. The second thing I want to talk about is how we can work around 218. Because as a lawyer representing families, oh, that's how I need to think. And I, I always need to see that light at the end of the tunnel. And I always need to find a creative solution for my clients because I'm not gonna let a piece of legislation dictate what I think is just and fair, especially in these circumstances. So the wording of, co of, of Bill 218 is that no nursing home, really no entity, but no, in this context, no nursing home or retirement home can be held liable for a resident contracting COVID if they made a good faith effort to follow public health guidelines and municipal, provincial, and federal law. And they have not been grossly negligent. And the legislation defines good faith effort, here's the kicker, as an honest effort, whether that effort was reasonable or not. That's, the prob that's one of the problematic pieces of the wording of the legislation. Our courts do not know how to interpret a subjective test like that. Our courts know how to interpret reasonableness. That's objective. Was someone reasonable, given the circumstances, or not? That's not this, this legislation is essentially giving a free pass. Oh, someone just asked if I could repeat that. A good faith effort is an honest effort, whether that effort was reasonable or not. The caveat is, the exception really, is that if there's gross negligence, they can still be held liable. So in fact, what we're really talking about here is the difference between regular simple negligence and gross negligence. And you all are gonna say, well, Melissa, what's the difference between the two? And the answer is, I don't have a damn clue <laughs> because our courts have not had to interpret that test in a way that's meaningful to apply to these types of cases, which is why when this bill was first introduced, I prepared submissions along with many other stakeholders criticizing uh, that definition and criticizing the inclusion of the wording gross negligence. So to put it simply, negligence is, okay, you know what, I screwed up. I forgot to change my mask going from this resident's room to this resident's room. Now resident number two got COVID. That's simple negligence. That is no, it, you can't sue for that now given Bill 218. What's gross negligence? Something like a market departure. So a very serious departure from what is reasonable in the circumstances. And we just don't know what that means yet. And so taking now to you know, part number two, how I can creatively get around this, in my view, 
I think any home that was the subject of a military investigation, any home that has um, massive outbreaks and that did very little, if anything, to prepare for the pandemic, that's gross negligence. Um, I think I'm, and I can speak for any lawyer who's got a case out there against a nursing home is gonna argue that they were mostly all grossly negligent. So this legislation is not gonna get rid of any lawsuits. It's just gonna make the fight a little bit harder. Um, it means we need more evidence of what was systemically going on behind closed doors because we're not necessarily gonna be able to point to one instance of negligence. Um, it's, it's a travesty of justice because this government interfered with our existing rule of law, but it's still a fight that we can win and it's a fight that I still plan to win. So that's, uh, I'll turn it back over to Vivian. I could say a lot more about that, but I know that you guys probably have a, a ton of questions. Yeah, I have a feeling you're gonna get a lot of questions after it. Thank you, Melissa. Melissa is amazing. She's very fierce. Uh, all these women that I invited on today are very, very fierce, which is why I uh, obviously gravitate towards them. And last but not least of the fiercest of women is our very own uh, NDP MPP for Oshawa, Jennifer French. Where are you, my dear? Hi. There she is. Okay, you can see and hear me, can you? Um, folks, I wanted to uh, to really appreciate that this is an organized event um, and thank you very much. We're not just organizing it, but sharing it widely. I see that there are many folks who have joined this um, and I think for probably as many reasons as there are families, um, you know, there's, there's a lot going on. It's hard to keep up. Um, I say that from my office at Queens Park um, today, unfortunately, was Bill 218, as we heard about, was the final reading. Um, Kathy, just so you know, I, I read part of part of your last ditch attempt to sway this government. I wrote, I read part of your letter um, and said that you have had to become an advocate and an activist, as have many on this uh, on this um, forum, but across the community, because what has happened has just been uh, gut wrenching, and. Um, and I wanna say that while we have listened to the different uh, speakers tonight, I am reminded of something that happened when I first got elected. So when I was first elected, one of my early appointments um, was with uh, PSW. So it was with some QP um, personal support workers. And I remember that there was a, a gentleman who sat in my office and had been doing this work for many years. I don't remember how many. And he sat in my office and he cried because he loved his residents and wasn't able to help them, wasn't able to spend the time needed that, you know, he knew that they were going to die alone. And I remember being, you know, so offended at that concept um, back, back then. And that was, you know, six years ago. And these were the workers who have been sounding the alarm. The families have been sounding the alarm, um, you know, to Vivian's point and, and Melissa's point that this is, there's a long record of um, whether it's negligence or neglect, um, turning a blind eye and a lack of accountability. Families have come to my office for years um, with struggles getting their loved one on the waiting list, through the waiting list, into a home. And then once they're in a long-term care home, um, oftentimes then we hear about quality of, of um, you know, standards of care, that the fact that there aren't standards of, of care the way we would imagine, um, that it, the quality of life, um, the lack of uh, incontinence supplies, um, I mean, everything. And so for years, um, you know, I have, I have played my part in, in advocating um, for better standards and working alongside the people who've been sounding the alarm for years. Um, you know, I'm, I'm appreciative of the attention that has been paid to the military reports, uh, you know, when we were right in the thick of it at the beginning uh, with COVID-19. But it was, it was frustrating also to know that many agencies, you know, the, the Ontario Health Coalition, for example, uh, many of the seniors uh, advocacy groups have been sounding the alarm for years. Um, anyway, not to dwell, um, but to, to move forward. Um, but these are not issues new to me and I, I'm in it. Uh, I'm, I'm in it very sincerely with the families um, and will continue to do that work. And so since since the beginning of COVID-19, um, I have it has been my 
privilege, frankly, uh, to work alongside many of the families that are struggling um, to make any sense of this, uh, that are, are grieving. And now we're adding, unfortunately, the insult to injury um, in the fact that we have bills like 218, um, where it will make it more challenging for families um, to pursue any kind of, of justice. Um, I mean, yes, the complicating factors and, and higher thresholds of, of you know, gross negligence or, or what have you that Melissa was eloquently breaking down for us, but it also comes down to these are massive corporations with deep pockets and we're, you know, opposite families um, going through what is, I imagine, some of the most challenging uh, heartache that they can endure. Um, but also it's been a struggle as we have, you know, as, as a member of the official opposition, we had an opposition day, which the short version of that is we sort of, if we were government, this is a motion that we, you know, put forward and we debate it and we have the chance to actually decide what's debated. So we, we called for an end to, um, you know, to take the profits out of long-term care, right? With a focus on public versus private, public versus for-profit. Um, of course, it didn't pass and it was actually really upsetting to hear the argument back from the government side. Um, we have continued to put bills forward, like my colleague, Laura May Lindo. Uh, she's the MPP for um, Kitchener Center, and that's the seniors advocate uh, bill. She wants to have a seniors advocate that, that is responsible to families for seniors. Um, Lisa Gretzky, of course, put forward the More Than a Visitor Act, and I know, um, you know Dr. Vivian has been very involved in that, and, and we are so grateful uh, for her voice and, and action on that. Um, and Teresa Armstrong's A Time to Care Act, which has been before this legislature like four times. And while it's passed, there's no money in the budget. And this isn't something that we will see um, you know, before the next election, certainly. Uh, and I would argue this government has no intention, despite the fact that they have agreed um, in theory, uh, that we do indeed need those minimum standards of care, the, the number of hours of hands-on care. Um, we brought forward, and, and I would invite folks to check it out. You can go online and look up the NDP um, platform piece that we've brought forward. It's, um, I'm just looking at my notes, what's it called? <laughs> I wanted to be specific. Oh, the Aging Ontarians Deserve the Best, a new public and non-profit uh, home care and long-term care system. So it's quite involved. Um, I won't get into it now, but it outlines sort of eight commitments um, that we we think should be the priorities either were we to form government or also as part of the conversation right now around what should long-term care look like and the emphasis on care. Um, Bill 218, we have talked about that. It was very upsetting. I of course voted no today, um, but fat lot of good it does when you have a, a government with that determination um, to do what they will do. Um, one of the things that I will briefly touch on because I, I can't delve into it too much, I don't have it in front of me yet, because of the work that we've been doing with families, because of the work, not just that I have been doing, but um, you know, across communities, there is such a lack of accountability. There isn't, um, there aren't the consequences that you would imagine. If something bad happens and it could have been prevented, we should hold folks accountable. Um, that has galled me from the beginning uh, with Orchard Villa, with a, a stack, you know, like this thick of of um, orders against them, of investigations, of problems. It was a problem home um, and they were able to operate, you know, just do what they wanna do. And then we find ourselves in this scenario and we look back and we think there were so many chances for them to do better and others like them. Um, so there isn't anything in terms of accountability. I sat opposite the minister uh, at estimates committee last week or the week before on October 21st whenever that was, so a few weeks ago. Um, and I asked her uh, about fines and she basically said, well, that would be punitive. And you know, we find a softer approach is better. You can look it up, <laughs> not making it up. Um, and, and there have been no, there have been two closures in the past two decades. And those closures were actually requested by the homes because they wanted out of it. It again was not about accountability or consequences. So. Um, it's not just the punitive side, but we do think the accountability, transparency, and ease for the families to be able to, you know, complain and not get the runaround. Um, we want clear, uh, we want to clear the waiting list. We want to be able to actually um, 
you know, move people through so that they know what the process is. But all of these things come back to if our goal is is indeed care, um, then we have to do that work. So I'm committed to it. And, and of course, I'm always available. So if anyone on this call lives in Oshawa, reach out anytime. And if you don't live in Oshawa, um, you still know where to find me. Uh, I'm doing a lot of a lot of work and sticking my nose where it don't belong across Durham region because somebody has to. Thank you, Jennifer. Jennifer's the best. Um, I think at this point we open it up to questions and um, I guess you can either type it into the chat or if you're brave, you can turn on your camera and ask us a question and actually join the conversation. Happy to see your faces, but we'll leave it to uh, all of you guys right now, you guys and gals. Um, I'd like to ask a question if I may. Uh, it's Joanna Zavito here. Hi, Jen. Haven't seen you in a long time, but you're doing awesome work. Very nice to meet all of you. Um, I am find myself in the unfortunate situation that my mother is in a long-term care home, a nonprofit, but uh, she's in York Region and um, the it was like draconian is not, it's an insufficient term to describe I have not been able to lay eyes on my mother in any way since September. I've had two visits since March. Her admission date was March 16th. And you know from the mm -hmm. process of being on the wait list, you're given that option of, do you want a bed or do you want to just basically fuck off, right? Like you can't either accept it or go away, right? And so we found ourselves in the situation where my mom needs this care and we had no other option. I actually think she's getting, well, I have reason to believe she's getting reasonably good care, but actually I don't know because I haven't been able to see her. She has Alzheimer's, so she can't do virtual visits. Because of the way she was admitted, we couldn't set up a phone for her. So I've literally not been able to, I, they are, the home that she's in won't let us have window visits. Like I don't understand that safety precaution if you can't have window visits, literally no contact. And when I filed a complaint with the patient ombudsman and then with the ministry, it was only then that the staff at the home were calling me and it's then that I found out that she had taken a fall. She's in a ward with other Alzheimer's patients and people were wandering into her room and she ended up in a scuffle with another resident and had a fall but they didn't tell me about that until maybe about two days later only because I filed complaints. So my question to you then is if I've gone through the patient ombudsman, if I've gone through the ministry, which by the way, their answer was nothing we can do, public health is calling the shots. I asked if I could speak to the people at York Region Public Health. The answer was no, they won't accept a call. Um, I looked up online about what the York Region Public Health directives were and was told, oh, directive three. Like they're in interpreting this in the most strict way possible. And even though I'm asking, like, let me in. I've been designated an essential caregiver. I'm not allowed in at all. So it's been like since September 18th was the last time I saw my mom at an outdoor visit. So I guess my question to all of you is, do you have any other recourse? Have I exhausted every avenue? Is there anything else we can do? How do we put pressure on these places so that I can see her? And oh, thank Joanne. you for taking my question. Joanne, I'm sorry to hear that. Um, if I can jump in quickly, I would say that one person you should talk to is um, Lisa from the Justice Center because she is still uh, fighting that charter challenge and she's taking on families that um, are, con are right now like it would be perfect for her in terms of not being, um, being able to get it and that's just ludicrous what you are going through. Um, and then I mean, not that you know most families and this is the issue with with um coming forward is that a lot of families are very fearful rightly so and it makes perfect sense of speaking up and going public because you, you, it's a cat you're a captive audience in those homes and you you can't be there to see what happens and this is what i hear from families all the time um but i've, I've had some success for families that have come forward and, and um i find that a lot of homes do not like uh public acknowledgement of their failures so i mean i can help with that i can help connect you with people if you if you want to come forward and, and have stories in that sense but that's that's what I can offer um, I'm sure the other ladies have some suggestions too can I just say I have one quick thing put a nanny cam in her room I haven't been able to get access to her room. 
You like have, I literally, I have not been in that yeah. building since March 16th. And you, because you're not designated as an as a as not essential, but a caregiver, is that why? Not one and of the. I, few didn't, I mean, nobody told me that was an option until. Oh. Six, it is. What about howling? What about hounding the media? Like for myself, my mother is in is in uh, Madonna long term care and in Ottawa here. And I started and I've been after, I've been talking to anybody who will listen. I got fed up with the, I'm also the chair of the family council. And I had so many family members contact me at the very beginning, you know, their loved one, I have four of them where their loved ones died alone. Um, and then, and just other severe, severe issues within Madonna itself. And I, I spoke with the newspaper. I spoke with CBC, I spoke, anybody who will listen. I just, I, I'm sorry, I think I'm getting feedback. My apologies. Um, I just hounded anybody who will listen because Nick, you took my it's phone. outrageous what, what's going on. It's outrageous. So Agreed. what about the media? Agreed. Vivian? Vivian, can I? Um, yeah. Can I just in? Please. Okay. Um, so. Joanne, I'm uh, I'm really sorry that this has been your experience, and I will be really relieved to hear when you're able to see your mom. Um, who is whoever your MPP is? Um, you want to start a paper trail there that they are advocating for you, um, but also the patient ombudsman is sort of that arm's length of the government, right? We used to fight that we wanted it to be separate. Um, it's it's still all kind of interconnected. However, the Ontario Ombudsman is fielding a lot um, of complaints. I don't I don't know what you would find um, if you reach out to them, but the Ontario Ombudsman, from what I'm hearing from some families, is just shocked and appalled. Right. So the more that that the uh, Ontario Ombudsman is kind of uh, finding out about it, uh, there may end up being kind of a decision or action from their office as well. Um, but you can also reach out to my office um, and, and Jack and Andrew can maybe connect with you to, to give a better recommendation. They do the casework. Um, I just, you know, at the political level, make sure that you're holding your own MPP accountable and find out why you can't get in because they need to be, um, they need to be advocating or the one where the home is, both. Like, get them. <laughs> and there's a difference I want to point out between there is an Ontario Ombudsman, right? And then there's a patient Ombudsman and they're different. So yeah. get, go after both of them. Yeah. With the, with the patient Ombudsman being not as independent, uh, I'm hearing horrible things like when you, when families complain to the ministry, the ministry has been directing them back to a corporate liaison who works for the company and told, has told them that that is the person responsible for sorting out their complaints, which is, Anyway, um, not okay um, is a new a new kind of pain. So, uh, and if I may, um, because you know, from a lawyer's perspective, I'm always concerned about a paper trail. Uh, document all of this via email to the administration of the home. Demand uh, an explanation about in writing about why you can't get in. Um, you know, if, if, if you feel so moved, uh, take a look at the Residence Bill of Rights. Um, I can't tell you how many of those rights are being violated by not having someone be able to go in and see their loved one. I mean, the, one of the inherent problems is that, first of all, these, these policies and regulations keep changing constantly. Um, and in fairness to some of the homes, um, which I'm loathe to to give them any credit wherever. Um, but it's, it is challenging for them too. It's challenging for the staff in these homes um, who are you know, there day to day, not necessarily you know, the, the people making you know, the, the high six and seven figure incomes that we're hearing about for these for-profit homes, but the ones who are there answering the phones and, and dealing you know, with the front desk when you're trying to get a hold of them, they're trying to interpret all of this too. And some of them are interpreting it uh, in favor of the residents and trying to be inclusive. And some of them are interpreting it extremely strictly, not, not necessarily to give you a hard time, but they're terrified. They're terrified that they're gonna do something wrong and someone's gonna die. And the problem with that method is that in, in being so strict, someone's gonna die. 
because one of the largest workforces that we have to care for these people family. has been excluded from the homes and that's family and their work for free. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's so I mean, I would get it all in writing, quote the Bill of Rights. Um, you know, if you think that there's issues with care, quote those ones, you want to quote the one that talks about being able to receive visitors of their choice. If they're palliative, there's a Bill of Rights that deals with the resident's right to have someone there, someone from their family with them there 24 seven, if they're in their last days, and you have the right to know. Um, and just because we're in a pandemic doesn't mean they uh, have to, that they get to forfeit their obligation of, uh, of uh, notifying the substitute decision maker about changes in health or condition. So just attach the whole damn thing if you have to, but um, point to the ones that you think really speak to what's going on with you and just keep getting it in writing and do everything that everyone else has, has mentioned. If it helps, I wrote a, an early op-ed on, because this is what bothered me the most when I was, <laughs> when, you know, the, the directive came down that this was such a flagrant breach of the uh, Residence Bill of Rights. And there's 27 bill, there's 27 rights in, in that document. And I've, um, I've written about them and how some of them in specific are violated by those orders. So I can send that to anyone who, um, who needs. I, I know you want to move on and we should. But the Bill of Rights, wasn't this the government that took the Bill of Rights out of statute and have put it into regulations? So we are trying to have them put that, the patient's Bill of Rights back into statute, back into the actual, like they've taken it out and moved it into regulations where they can make changes and people can't see it. So I could have my details mixed up, but I don't think so. So that's awful. Lovely. I think we have a question by Patricia. I can see a hand. Yes. Hi, Patricia. Hello. What's your question? I'm Kathy's mother. Oh, <laughs> hello. I, I, met worked, I worked in Long, I worked in Orchard Villa for five years. I was there. Oh, mom, your mic's gone. <laughs> How do I turn it on? Oh, there you go. <laughs> Start again. We can hear you now. Okay. I, I, I was there prior to uh, Southbridge taking over. I saw what happened when they did. Uh, I saw the food uh, uh, quality going down. I saw the um, residence council not being listened to. I saw the staff being turned over constantly. Anybody with a conscience as to what was going on couldn't stomach stain, so they left. Um, I saw five different uh, heads of nursing leave. So my, my, I'm behind Kathy and all she's doing. And my question is this, the government's, uh, when I approached the member of uh, provincial, I said, where is their decency? He said, oh, that went out, uh, that went out the window in 1950s. I think it did. So now they've got no money. So are they going to listen to us when we're asking for change? We have to come up with some, like if it was, if it was an old car, and it was broken down as badly as it is, you would say, get a new car. We need a new car. We need a new, totally new revamp of the system. And we need to have uh, some insight into it and not allowing all the provinces to make their own decision. And that's the reason we're going to Ottawa and hopefully we'll be listened to, but I don't think they know how to begin to do it, to fix it. Well, they knew. <laughs> Yeah, they know. They, they, they know. know. Yep, yeah, they know. Feigned ignorance. Anyone else have a yep. question? Um, I do. Can you hear me? Yes. Hello. Good. Uh, hello. How are you guys? Good. How are you? Um, this question is from Melissa Miller. It's a bit of a personal question. Um, when you hear about these experiences and stories from your clients, like just hearing about them, like right now, like turns my stomach. So how do you emotionally and mentally prepare yourself when going into like the courtroom or like when you fight and represent your clients? That's a very good question. Um, you know, it's something that I struggle with all the time. Uh, especially, I have to say during COVID, these this has been all consuming. Um, and it feels like a helpless task most of the time. But I will say this, 
Um, I don't have a single client out of all of the hundreds that I represent that is not a fierce advocate for their loved one in some way, shape or form. I don't have a single client who is in this for the money. Every single one of them wants accountability. They want the system to change. And I think what I did was I turned, I, I turned it back on my clients and I said, what are you willing to do? Join me. And one of the ways that we're doing that, one of the ways that I feel empowered by my clients is by gathering them together. And this Thursday, we're doing a demonstration on Parliament Hill. And it's gonna be live streamed on Facebook and uh, Instagram. You can find us, uh, it's called Canadians for Long-Term Care Standards. We're on the Twitter and Instagram and Facebook, the whole nine yards. Kathy's heading up all of that social media stuff. Um, We've got uh, NDP leader Jagmeet Singh uh, coming to speak. There's a couple liberal MPs and uh, we've got the president of the Quebec Nursing Association. She's coming to speak as well, which I think is very telling because this is not, uh, these are not issues that affect only the residents. Um, one of the main issues why the residents have such a negative experience in long-term care homes is as we've heard, uh, the, the staffing. Uh, is is not there um, to a to a quality that's required, um, you know. So I I just turn my efforts to the to those things, um, and it's kind of re-energized me. But you know, I mean, I I take space and I take care of myself. I I did a Peloton spin class before joining this call, and that's how I blow, blow off some steam too. So you know, <laughs> Alyssa, good question. Uh -huh. though. Someone keeps asking the same question, so I just wanted to bring it to your attention. Are you able to give an example of gross negligence by chance? And that's from Jessica Wilkie. So that is a really good question. The, the, only, the only area in, personal, in the personal injury law world where gross negligence has any place is in, in municipal sidewalk cases, believe it or not. So the only time that our courts have to consider whether someone was injured as a result of gross negligence is in those cases. Um, our government has cleverly uh, immunized municipalities from having to pay out claims where people are injured on sidewalks unless the, the municipality was grossly negligent. Um, and, you know, and though it's extreme, it's an extremely high bar to meet. So, you know, you have to sort of prove that the municipality knew that, you know, they were leaving inches and inches upon ice and snow and that there were lots of reports and they did nothing about it and they never sent anyone out to salt or sand or whatever. Yeah, Jennifer, you're... Yeah, sorry. Um, and I, it, I'm not so excited. That's not what I knocked the table. <laughs> I had my legs crossed awkwardly. Um, somebody also was asking in the chat... Um, related to the gross negligence and you know why can't we just go after the money or, or whatnot um, and kind of that the litigious side um, one of the things that came up um, when I was speaking directly to the minister so I had the opportunity to sit opposite her on committee and ask very specific questions on record some of my colleagues did as well and I was trying to get I was trying to ask her or I was trying to get from her well then what are the punitive pieces are there any consequences is there any you know why aren't you finding them why are why is nothing happening um to to ensure that these homes are disincentivized you know like how do we and she she had okay I'm not going to mock her tone anyway um but what she um chose to say was that that would if we withheld money from them, um, then that would, you know, create, that would compound the problem. So she's saying all of the money that goes to these for-profit homes come from the government in an envelope. And so if you keep some of that money back, if you find them, that that is, you're keeping money from going to them. And I, my brain popped and then melted because then don't, don't let the fines come out of that envelope for crying out loud, have the fines come out of the profit margins because the incentive is profit. The incentive is not care. So that is something back to my, you know, want to be private members bill that we're, we're fleshing out right now and putting together. That's a piece of it is how to make fines or any kind of consequence be um, 
be effective and also be an actual deterrent um, because punitive is not an incentive, right? Or even a disincentive. But if these massive corporations that are advertising right now to their folks saying, hey, you know what? Ford has done us a solid. Now it's that much safer, you know, invest here. We need to, uh, we need to restrict, there should be no profits in care, but this is the system that we have. So anyway, so to the people who well, are like, money's what they speak. Yeah, but the yeah. system is set up so that we can't make it hurt them. And that's where, you know, when you talk about that envelope of money going to them, that's where we need um, transparency. We need to know, okay, so if the government is giving X amount of dollars, what are you buying with that? <laughs> Who are you paying with that? Yeah. What are your policies and procedures? Do, why don't these homes have to report back to the government about what policies they're putting in place in their homes to manage those dollars. Yeah. We don't see any of that. They just get a blank bloody check. Yeah, and they just so that folks at home, the money is, there are some silos, like they can't just take this and use it over here, but from what they can turn a profit from, Melissa's right, we have no idea. And Kathy, what is the stamp basically on the Southbridge homes, like on Orchard Villa? That's in the, it's a broader umbrella family. And the care. Extend to care. So there's also money to be made by Extend to Care, Chartwell, Sienna, all of these big ones, they sort of sell their name and their, their how-to manuals and some company and some home like Southbridge's Orchard Villa stamps it with Extend to Care so they can, you know, um, entice families with, look, we're, we're in this group and they actually make money off that too. Like the layers of nonsense and awful. Anyway, sorry, the call is not long enough, but suffice it to say, it's awful. Well, and I want to say too that, you know, the next thing that we need to be really concerned about on that note is at home care, because back in June, Bill 175 was passed. Um, so what we saw with the privatization of long term care homes is what we are going to see with what we all know is like CCAC, like in, in care uh, home, sorry, in home care. So in home care is like anything from Mm -hmm. after surgery um, and you just need you know a nurse to come and do a wound dressing or you have someone who's mostly independent but needs some help with you know daily living and so you'll have someone come in a, f a few times a day whatever and that all right now the in-home care or was uh, government funded and run by government and now that is moving to a private model incidentally oh, yeah. when you look at what the trajectory was of some of these for-profit companies extended care to be specific and how they've um, broadened their umbrella and how they've set up some of their subsidiary companies. Well, there's been a lot, there's a huge profit margin now available for, um, oh my gosh, what's the name? It's uh, the name is escaping me. The extended care uh, in home care company. Oh my gosh. It's part of their umbrella. Then their Bay name is escaping. Bayshore? Right? Is it Bayshore? Not ba no, 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 not Bayshore. No. Um, Paramed. Paramed. Thank you. Someone just te uh, texted uh, that. Uh, I that. Yeah, Paramed. Um, you know, like there's there's a lot of money to be made um, for these companies, and we're going to see a huge deterioration because. The reason why the, the existing government hasn't done anything is because to keep these homes accountable means the government has to come up with new policies and more dollars to fund proper care. And well, they just, they aren't. It, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna put a little asterisk there, Melissa, and say there's probably a few more layers that are a little more nefarious than just that they don't wanna put in the work because the people who, stand to benefit and profit are well-known names to us. You know, like yes. um, Mike Harris, the Mike Harris um, yeah. is making a killing off of this. And yeah, yeah. my wording and is inappropriate, but not really, right? And I see that we're out of time, Vivian, but if you ever want to have us back and have a go, yeah. <laughs> I haven't even talked about transitional care beds and that whole layer. If anybody has folks in transitional care units, please reach out to my office. We're just starting to gather that because that is unregulated and an awful story waiting to happen. Just yeah, yeah I, I get a lot of calls about transitional care. Thank all you all so much. I am so glad that 
we have had these women come and share their stories and their expertise and given us directions to go for more information in the future. Um, I would also encourage you to take a look at the Oshawa Public Library website. They've compiled um, some resources based on information provided by Dr. Vivian for people who are looking to learn even more about these issues and these topics. So there's ways for you to get even more information about this to keep yourself up to speed. I also wanted to encourage you, especially um, while we are on the subject of important public health issues, uh, to take a look at our next speaker series that is happening in two weeks on November 30th. And we will be joined by Dr. Stephen Hale, who is a criminology professor at Ontario Tech to talk about supervised consumption facilities, safer supply and the decriminalization. What lessons can we learn from how this is playing out in countries beyond Canada? So once again, if you will join me in a round of virtual applause oh. for our fabulous panelists this evening, and I got two more things before we go. Sorry. Coming and joining us as well. Thank you so much. One more thing, one more thing. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, there's a big event happening this Thursday. I know Melissa threw to it, but um, the details are on my Twitter and on Facebook groups. I'm not on the Facebook. I sound really old there. I don't use Facebook. Um, but um, tune in. It's going to be really cool. And also for all my students who happen to be on this call, I want to point out that Dr. Nancy Olivieri is here. And I want to say hi to her because I've taught you all about her and she is a magnificent whistleblower. Um, and I'm a huge fan of her, so I'm really excited to see her here. And I just wanted to say hi and let all my students know this is the lady I taught you about in our ethics class. So uh, that aside, um, thank you everyone for coming. It was my pleasure. I'm so happy you all came and I will definitely organize another one of these because there's so much more to say. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Good everybody. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Good night.